I am very, very excited to be able to welcome Nathaniel Smith to have a conversation with me. Um, I love the fact that I trusted, brother, that uh, you were known very well by St. Luke's Church, but I'm getting reacquainted with St. Luke's after having been away for 35 years, and I don't know, and, and certainly Atlanta, I've been away for 35 years, and don't know who knows whom. However, I trust that the caliber of engagement of St. Luke's people in the issues of Atlanta and the way Nathaniel came into my mind through my dear trusted friend Gregory Ellison, who is a close friend of his, that we were all going to be in great shape. Now, um, he and I are going to unpack first what he does and how he came to it. Um, what the need is in Atlanta. But then we're going to pull back the layers and talk about this business of love and freedom, love and justice, which I think is the theme of the day because it's Absalom Jones Day. And um, Nathaniel was kind and generous enough at this time to come and uh, worship with us at 9 o'clock so he knows where we're going. And he and I had a, a very important telephone conversation um, this past week, and he told me about uh, a lot of his legacy that he has received from being a child of parents who were close to, to Dr. King and being steeped in those values and Kingian values and how that's led to him doing what he's doing in Atlanta. So, let me, just for the sake of a very, very brief introduction, say that Nathaniel is the founder and chief equity officer, CEO, of the Partnership for Southern Equity. And his, one of his passions, and the passions of his organization, is balanced growth and inclusive prosperity in metropolitan Atlanta and beyond. So first, Will you join me in warmly welcoming Nathaniel Smith? Welcome, Tony. Welcome. Nathaniel, may I call you Nathaniel instead of Mr. Smith? Yes, you may. Can everyone hear me by chance? I think they're still working. Can you hear me now? Let me see. Okay, look at your box and see if it's turned on. Okay. Sure. Um, let me let me check in and see um is that green is light on? on good okay uh, i am yes two thank you elizabeth so what in the world is the partnership for southern equity wow um, <laughs> that's a, that could be a loaded story it all depends on who you ask she's gonna see if the box is no thank you very much you're coming to the rescue hello Hello, hello, hello. Can folks hear me? Okay, I think folks. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, is that better? Thank you very much. Okay, I hate these things, y'all. I know. So please, please have mercy on me. But um, if, if Madonna can sing with them, right, you can speak right, with them. Right, I, I hope so. Um, so, you know, the, the Partnership for Southern Equity is an organization that is committed um, to bringing people together um, to speaking out collectively around uh, issues that are challenging our community. Um, it is an organization that is committed to encouraging people that to, to understand that uh, we all share a, a shared destiny um, as a community. And that if we are to move forward to realize what Dr. King defined as the beloved community, that we all do better when we all do better, um, that we, we cannot continue uh, to focus inward as it relates to our prosperity as a community, but we have to begin to look outward and act outwardly um, as it pertains to the various challenges that we face in our communities. Uh, there are many, many challenges, of course, uh, some easier to tackle than others. 
Um, we believe that one of the major challenges in our community today is structural racism. Mm -hmm. um, the, the belief that one segment of our community uh, is an enemy mm -hmm. or, or is inferior uh, to another segment of our community not only hurts those communities that are being left behind, but it is an, a, a real challenge that is hurting all of us. I always use, for example, the analogy about public transportation and the gridlock challenges that we face in our region. Um, when uh, the decision was made to expand MARTA or to even think about MARTA, our Metropolitan uh, Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, um, there was a regional vote that would have provided an opportunity for the larger segments of our region, the larger counties, to have a chance to accept MARTA into their communities. Um, after the vote, we realized and saw that only two counties in one city decided to allow MARTA in. Um, that was, of course, Fulton County and DeKalb County and the city of Atlanta. Um, the unfortunate aspects of, or aspects specifically of that story is is that the other counties did not choose to allow MARTA in because of the color of the buses. I'll say that again. Um, those counties did not allow MARTA in. It wasn't because of the color of the buses. It was because of the color of the people who rode those buses, right? Yeah. And now, today, when we are trying to get in to work every day, uh, we all sit in traffic. I have yet to see black traffic in this city of Atlanta. Um, I have yet to see white traffic in this city of Atlanta. Um, I don't see Hispanic traffic or Asian traffic. We all sit in traffic. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about these issues of racial inequity, it's not just about communities of color that suffer. We all suffer. And so we have to begin to understand how that is influencing us on a daily basis and how we must move past that and realize a better community, not only through better policy, but also better people. And that is the work of the Partnership for Southern Equity. Got it. Mm -hmm. So let's come back to transportation in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's just acknowledge that that's one of the uh, expressions of institutional and structural systemic racism that we have in, mm -hmm. in the metropolitan Atlanta. You have a couple of other uh, yes. focuses? Yes, yes. So um, we have four primary areas that we focus in. Uh, one area is around uh, creating an uh, economy that is working for everyone. Um, and we call that area just opportunity, which mm -hmm. really focuses a great deal on ensuring that, that, that our economy is working for us, for everyone, not only for the people who are doing really, really well, but that all people should have a chance to, to reach their full potential in this economy. Uh, we call that area just opportunity. We also have an area that focuses on the challenges that we face around climate issues mm -hmm. and the challenges that we face around energy issues. Mm -hmm. There are individuals in our city that have to choose between buying groceries or paying their light bill. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. Um, how do we begin to find a way to ensure that we realize uh, a, a, an environment, an energy economy that is not only uh, uh, provides cheap energy, but also provides an opportunity for people to succeed as we transition to clean energy. Um, we also work in an area that is focused on growth. Um, as you know, the, the city of Atlanta is becoming less and less affordable for many of our working families. How can we work together to ensure that we are actually creating places that are a true reflection of our values and that people are not being forced out of this city because of the various challenges that we face around affordability? Mm -hmm. And that area that we focus in is just growth. And our last area is around health. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're dealing with many, many challenges in, in, our, in our state. And so that is work that we do statewide. In rural Georgia, many of the hospitals are beginning to close. Um, in counties like Clay County, if someone has a heart attack, it would probably be the best thing for you. Um, the best thing for you to do is actually to send them to the funeral home 
uh, versus uh, getting in a car to go to a hospital because that hospital is usually over an hour away. Mm -hmm. So we have to begin to understand that our health and not just access to hospitals, but where you live. Um, in the city of Atlanta, for example, you have some young people where it is easier to find a honey bun than a head of lettuce, right? Or some communities where you have access to no grocery stores at all. We call those communities food deserts. Mm -hmm. um, how can we begin to find a way again to create places that truly, truly provide opportunities to, for people to reach their full potential? And we believe that growth, our economy, our environment, and our health will play a role in our ability to create a more inclusive society. Can we have some applause on this? Uh, that's just what an agenda, an amazing agenda. And just as a new, newly returned person to Atlanta, it feels so good that somebody of your passion has identified these what's. Yeah. And we are definitely with you on the why, yes. because we really do stake our lives here on a theology of that we are all in this together, the network of mutuality, yes. the whole sense of oneness. So let's talk about the how. Yes. So, gosh, what a great and inspiring agenda. I just want to breathe that in. Yes. I want you to hear our support for that. So talk to, talk to us about the how. Yes. So how are you intervening? Yes. Well, as a, as a reformed uh, researcher uh, and a policy wonk, uh, I think on many occasions we forget that change begins not with big policy or with even big ideas, but big relationships. That we have to begin the process of creating places where people have an opportunity to come together and, 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 and figure out many of the various challenges that we have in our communities, that, that we are more alike than we are different, and that some of the challenges that you may be experiencing, another person may be experiencing the same thing. And even more important, usually, um, from, from the work that I've done, you can hold it to your mouth if you want to. I've learned that courage is contagious, yes. right? And that if you can you to help create you? spaces for people to come together, thank you, Ed, create spaces for people to come together and really begin to look at um, the various challenges that we're facing, not just from a position of being overwhelmed, but to understand that we can do this together, um, great, great, great things can happen. So first, it has to begin with creating safe spaces where people can get to know each other and understand that change can happen if we believe. Second, then it becomes this question about whether our shared beliefs can potentially be strong enough to change the beliefs that are influencing the world that we're facing today. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Many people fail to understand that it, at its essence, that public policy is just a reflection of the values of people in power. That's all it is. Policy is the reflection of the values of people in power. So how can we begin the process of creating a new interconnected set of values. Dr. King called it a, a, a revolution, a revolution of values that will begin the process of creating the type of public policy and the type of community that we want for all people. Um, so we call that work the work of, of, of weaving values in a way that will elevate a new way forward through public policy value-based organizing. We actually work with various leaders and communities around developing a set of shared beliefs that will work to advance a common agenda. After that, then we begin the process of doing the research. Because again, because unfortunately we live in a time where many of the decisions that are being made that affect our communities are not based on the facts, right? 
we have to begin to elevate those facts in a way, the real facts in a way, that will create the type of communities that we want. Uh, a wise man once said, you have a right to your own opinion, but not your own facts. Right. So, so how do we begin the process of, of elevating the facts in a way that will again work to heal our work in a way that will heal our communities? And so, through us, through through our work at the end of the day, all of those uh, tactics, I would say, research, leadership development, policy advocacy creating safe spaces for people to come together, and then even more important, putting the communities that are suffering the most at the center of the change that needs to occur. <laughs> you know, change, you know, we talk a great deal about the, the various communities that are suffering in our city. We have to humble ourselves and understand that a lot of the solutions that we're looking for are actually found in the minds and the hearts of Absolutely. the people that we proclaim to support and help. Absolutely. It is not our role to save anybody. Right. We, we, we have no S on our chest. Uh, we're not Superman or in a more contemporary sense, if some of you have seen the movie Black uh, Panther, none of us are T'Challa. That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to create the conditions for the people um, to lead themselves and for us to be behind them as we work to create a better society. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. Really, really wonderful. So I'd love to get a, a taste of your work. Yeah. If you could kind of talk about a winnable or an, an exciting event that happened that really kind of advanced yes. our journey, our project, our aspirations, and give us a, give us a sense of what you did in your organization, what, what it yes. did. Well, I, well, I'll give you two examples Good. Um, that, um, because again, the, the work of justice is, is built big, brick by brick. True. Um, and it takes time to get to that breakthrough. But I will elevate two specific um, wins, I guess you could say. I hate to use that terminology because we're all continuing to do this work. One occurred actually in Clayton County, um, which is a suburban county um, on the south side of our region. Uh, historically, Clayton County was a predominantly black, I mean predominantly white county. Um, the county now is predominantly African American. Um, unfortunately, over 90% of the children in Clayton County are on free and reduced lunch. Mm. Um, it is a very challenged county uh, near the airport um, where the development has not occurred in a way that has created the type of opportunities for the people in those communities. For many, many, many years, again, remember the history of Martin and the history of only two counties in the city allowing public transportation to come uh, to their particular counties. During that time, when, when Clayton was majority white, they chose not to accept Martin. Um, and as a result of that, now, you have a, a great deal of people that need public transportation. Unfortunately, Clayton County went for years without public transportation. Um, and it, it either forced people who needed access to jobs to leave out, or left people who lived in those communities victims of an underground transportation economy. Mm. That, that really um, created a real challenge for them mm. because of the transportation costs mm. that they faced. Um, we had an opportunity to work in Clayton County uh, with the faith community, um, a state representative by the name of Michael Glanton in Clayton County uh, to elevate a, an initiative called the Power of the Penny Campaign um, in partnership with other key partners with the private sector as well to actually organize not only the approval of the opportunity for Clayton County to accept MARTA, but to actually pass a $13 million referendum that allowed MARTA to come into Clayton County and expand for the first time in over 40 years. Mm. Um, that was a wonderful, wonderful day for the people of Clayton County because how can you pursue happiness? We talk about the pursuit of happiness. How can you pursue happiness if you can't get there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't. 
So, so, so this conversation about access, not just mobility, is central. And, and so that really created now a chain reaction where MARTA is now beginning to expand in places around the region. And people are finally beginning to understand that public transit is not about race. There was a time in Atlanta where the MARTA, the acronym for MARTA for some people in the community was not the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, but moving Africans rapidly through Atlanta. Wow. This is the truth. Yeah. Right? So we have to begin to move beyond that and understand, well, why is it not racialized in places like New York or in the Bay Area? or in D.C. So, so we have to understand that. So that was a, a great, great win for the community and now we're gearing up to, to hopefully engage in Gwinnett County now, which is about to also have a referendum in March around expanding MARTA. Um, and then the second thing that, that I'm really honored to have an opportunity to engage in is for many, many years I've been involved in the Atlanta Beltline. Um, and the Atlanta Beltline is a large-scale development project that is happening in the heart of the city. Um, it is being funded by uh, tax revenue, um, and it is, within the context of its development, been extremely successful. Um, unfortunately, though, that success has created displacement, um, that success has created gentrification, um, and that success has not necessarily, even though the founder of the Beltline, Ryan Gravilla, and our dear friends, it was initially thought of as a way to connect the city and bring the si various aspects of the city together. But unfortunately, for many, many, many years with the Beltline, um, the love of profit began to take precedence over the love of people. So at the time, I had an opportunity to serve on one of the boards of the Beltline, and um, it was beginning to move in a very unfortunate direction. And so because of that move, uh, the founder of the Beltline and I decided to resign from the Beltline board um, and provide a joint letter saying pretty much about what you said during your sermon. That, that love should be the drive of the belt line and not profit. Mm -hmm. um, as a result of us coming together, as a result of the, our organization, PSC, um, moving that work forward, uh, uh, there was a political decision made that the gentleman that was actually leading the belt line at the time uh, needed to be replaced. Um, over $19 million were found by the city of Atlanta to begin the process of supporting additional affordable housing for the city. Um, and a new leader came in at the time and also new positions were embedded in the Beltline that actually created an opportunity for, for equity to be elevated, the conversations around inclusion to be elevated in a way that they had never been elevated before in a substantive manner. Um, those are two key, um, I think, examples of what happens when you bring together not only the people for a better tomorrow, but courage, the courage that is required to advance a conversation and even more important solutions that may not be necessarily the most popular thing to do, but necessary if we are to move forward as a community. Excellent. So before I open us up to uh, questions, let me, ooh, <clears throat> we don't have much time. The question that we have to ask is, how can you and your organization partner, or better yet, how can an organization like this, a bunch of brilliant people who care, right. uh, and who are not afraid yes. to, um, to say the word structural racism, than that it's a, a reality and that it is a slow form of violence. Right. How can a group like us partner with you for you to have a more effective life? Mm. Or do you need to tell us to stay on our side of the line? You're doing very, very well and um, you're going to take care of yourself. 
Well, I'm definitely not saying that. <laughs> uh, believe me, there, there is uh, more than enough work to do. That there are a couple of things um, that, that I want to um, say to, to preface my response. Okay. Um, we live in a city right now where a poor child only has a 5% chance to rise out of poverty. Mm. Right now, uh, we live in a city that is number one for income inequality out of any city in the country. Mm. Right now, because of the development pressures that we are facing in our city, we are number one for the suburbanization of poverty mm. of any city, any region of our size in the country. And while at the same time we understand this, we're still a highly segregated city. 60% of whites live north of I-20, while 80% of African Americans live south of I-20. I-20 is our demarcation point. But yet, through all of the challenges that we're facing today, the prophetic voice of the church, the church that understands that at the end of the day that Christ was a voice for justice and love, has been silent. It has been silent as we drive by the bridges in this city and see the homeless freezing to death. We drive past communities like Thomasville Heights and Vine City and English Avenue and actually make ourselves believe that it's their fault mm. or there's nothing that can be done to help and support those people. We need the prophetic voice of the church in this city, in this region, more than we've ever needed the voice of the prophetic gospel ever, ever before. So the fundamental question is, you remember the bands that people used to wear, the WWJD bands? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Would Jesus be comfortable with where we are, with our circumstances in our city? Mm -hmm. what, what is our role to live Christ's life through our work? That is the fundamental question, and I believe that there is a great opportunity for parishes like St. Luke's and other uh, great areas where people are coming together to worship God to actually begin the process of living the sermon that you gave this morning mm -hmm. and not just receive it. Mm -hmm. um, we have to begin the process of going out into communities and understand that this church is bigger than the four walls that are containing us right now. Atlanta is your church, mm -hmm. not this church. And I think that it's important to begin the process of working with organizations like the Partnership for Southern Equity, supporting organizations like the Partnership for Southern Equity. And sometimes it's not about monetary support. Sometimes it's about showing up. Sometimes it's about leveraging your political influence as a way to lift a conversation in an uncomfortable situation speaking the truth even when your voice is shaking is the work it's the work so 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 i would definitely invite um, this congregation um, to engage in the work that is required to move our and not just our city you know the partnership for southern equity you know we were based here you know my family is actually from a community in atlanta called reynolds town um, which, if you're not familiar with Reynolds Town, it was the first uh, community established in this city by free slaves. Uh, I, I went not too far uh, from here to high school at Grady High School. Uh, I did. I went not too far from here for college, Morehouse College. 
So this is, I love this city. And I love you. But guess what? Real love, real love, the love that is transformational is about loving someone else's child as much as you love your own. And that is what this work is about. That if you're serious about moving this work forward, you cannot separate this work from love. And if, you, and if you're embedding this work with love and a deep commitment to justice, then you've got to be willing to love somebody else's loved one as much as you love your own. Mm. So, so, that, so, so it's not just about, and again, you're, you're the preacher, not me. Um, I like your preaching. No, no, no. I do like your no, preaching. I, I leave it to the professionals. <laughs> but, 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 but at the end of the day, um, I, I tell my staff um, and the people who are friends of the Partnership for Southern Equity that equity is not a what. Equity is a way. It is a way that you choose to live your life. It is a way that you choose to do the work. It is the way that you choose to be courageous. And, and if we choose to believe that equity is a way and not a what, then we also have to believe, and it goes back to your sermon, that at the end of the day, Ed, that equity is love in action. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what it is. That's exactly right. Equity is love in action. And, and, if you, and, and if I could put that into a ball and a, and, a, and a bowl and wrap it up and give it to the congregation, to me, that would be the way that I would ask for the congregation to engage and, 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 and engage in partnership with the communities that need us the most and, and not assume again that we have all of the answers but be willing to listen and understand that the solutions that we're looking for are in the communities that are being left behind. Thank you. So the angels moving around us mean that it's almost time for the 1115 worship. So rather than, you know, what, one of my jobs is to always be disappointed that I can't go longer with my guests. <laughs> and having said that, I feel that I have um, not only been invited to, into this amazing community here at St. Luke's, but with Gregory Ells Ellison and me talking, and uh, he said, now Ed, if you're serious about this, he says, uh, I've got a, several friends I want to yes. send Yes. Uh, over a, a course of a, a, a ye the year, about once a quarter for us to kind of drop in and have yes. a conversation with you. So, Nathaniel, <clears throat> that is my way of saying we are with you. You are loved here. Your agenda is loved here. And your strategies are loved here. And I pledge myself, it, and they want to... And I pledge myself to stay in touch with you. Please, please. And we have started a very fruitful relationship. Yes. Thank you very much for being with us today. Really, really, really. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.